This week's episode of our show has been sponsored by our friends at Ghostfire Games, who have just launched their new Kickstarter, The Seeker's Guide to Twisted Taverns, which is live now on Kickstarter till March 6th. This is being developed by Logan at RuneSmith, and he is creating 14 entirely unique tavern locations for you to explore, filled with all sorts of new characters, items, monsters, and mechanics, and secrets abound to delve into. These amazingly creative taverns will stretch the bounds of fantasy and maybe give you a nice reminder of those wonderful cozy days spent in a, bu- in a bar with some good friends. The campaign is live on Kickstarter until March 6th, so check the links below to join in on the revelry. Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin, and we are the Dungeon Dudes. Welcome to our channel where we cover everything Dungeons and Dragons, including advice for players and guides for dungeon masters. We upload new videos on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. This is part two of our subclass tier rankings for the Rogue in Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. In this video, we're going to be looking at the four subclasses published for rogues in Xanathar's Guide to Everything. The Inquisitive, the Mastermind, the Scout, and the Swashbuckler. Part one of this video covered the Assassin, the Arcane Trickster, and the Thief. So make sure that you go check that out in the links below if you want to check out our part one of our rankings. If you look on the screen right now, you are going to see the criteria that we use to rank the subclasses. We've pitted the subclasses against each other and not those of other classes. Also keep in mind that we do not take role playing into account as we think that all rogues have an equal opportunity to be wonderfully role played. We may consider multi-classing at times, but it is not a core mechanic of our ranking system. And of course, we look at all elements of D&D play when we assess these subclasses. It's more than just how well they perform in combat. It's also how well these subclasses augment the core class's ability to contribute in exploration scenes, as well as problem solving and interaction moments or negotiations, diplomacy, and of course, with all the rogues, activities, cloak and dagger, thievery, backstabbing, deception, all that good stuff that rogues do when they're not stabbing people in the back. We are also still working on assessing the new subclasses introduced in Tasha's Guide to Everything, and in the coming months, we're going to be releasing several videos to showcase what our thoughts are on these new wonderful subclasses. There's a lot to discuss today, so let's get rolling. So first up, Kelly and I want to look back actually at our rankings from the first video, particularly because as we were looking at these four subclasses, We felt we kind of made a mistake with our ranking of one of the subclasses from the player's handbook. In the weeks that have passed, we've had lots of conversations on our YouTube channel and in our Discord regarding the Assassin Rogue, and we think that maybe we might have been a little too generous with it. As such, previously we gave this a B ranking, but thinking around of our own play experiences, our own thoughts, and the comments that we actually made in that episode, and the rankings that we're giving out to the other subclasses today, we've decided to downgrade our ranking for the Assassin from a B to a C, which feels a little bit more appropriate given the overall context of all the other subclasses, and the comments that we even made, and the comments that we received on the Assassin. So the first subclass that we're going to look at from Xanathar's Guide to Everything is the Inquisitive, a subclass very much inspired by the heroes from detective fiction and pulp fiction stories, that hard-boiled detective with an eye for detail, very much the characters like Sherlock Holmes uh, or any other sort of hard-nosed sleuths that get in and are able to see the clues where no one else can. Right away at third level, you gain ear for deceit. If you're trying to determine if a creature is lying through an instant sight check if you can count any roll of a seven or lower as an eight instead. You also gain eye for detail, which allows you to now use a bonus action for perception or investigation checks if you're looking for hidden creatures or clues. You also gain the insightful fighting feature right away at third level. As a bonus action, your rogue can make an insight check opposed by the deception check of another creature that you're fighting. If you win the check, you now can sneak attack that creature as long as you don't have disadvantage on your attack rolls. This ability doesn't have a range, it doesn't have any other requirements, and it is 
not ended unless you use it again against a different creature or one minute passes. A ninth level, you're going to gain steady eye. So now if you move less than half your speed, you can now gain advantage on any perception or investigation checks as well. At 13th level, you gain unearing eye. Provided you aren't blinded or deafened, you can now use your action to detect the presence of invisible creatures, illusions, and shape changers. When you use your action in this way, you know the creatures are present or that there's an illusion present, but it doesn't give you any actual insight or detail as to what the deception actually might be, only that it's happening and that it's there. You can use this feature a number of times per day equal to your wisdom modifier, a minimum of once, and you regain these features all on a long rest. And at 17th level, you gain eye for weakness. Now, if a creature is under the influence of your insightful fighting feature, you can add 3d6 to your sneak attack damage. So I'm going to declare my bias right off the bat and say that I've always felt that insight and perception are two of the most clunky skills in role-playing games in general. It's not something that Dungeons and Dragons gets right. And there's a ton of other role playing games, maybe with the possible exception of Gumshoe, that completely fail to handle these skills in any reasonable way. They always feel like a binary check. It's like either you made the check and you see it there, uh, or you failed the check and you don't. It also came as a surprise to me that the eye for detail feature let you make investigation and perception checks as a bonus action because it didn't actually occur to me that there was an action i had to look it up to remind myself that there's actually a search action that can be used in combat because by and large when i run investigation checks they usually take several minutes and perception checks are things that are almost done as a reaction they're not always an intentional thing the way the inquisitive engages with these skills is just non-functional and I would probably tell a player that wanted to play this class at my game that this class is just not going to work with the way that I run D&D. So in that respect, it's a D ranking for me because it's just it's just broken. Like these features just don't work. Those features aside, the insightful fighting is actually a pretty great way to reliably land sneak attack. And you get this pseudo true sight feature, which I just wish was flat out true sight, to be honest. Like I don't understand why it would be op for a, a rogue to be able to like call up true seeing once or twice per day and the eye for weak this is a great bonus damage feature that comes online at a very high level i overall think that this subclass is still kind of feels like a c i think the best thing this subclass has going for it is the insightful fighting giving you a really reliable way to land your sneak attack uh not a lot of creatures in the game have good deception checks so by and large you're probably going to have expertise in the insight. You're going to totally steamroll these checks. You can try over and over and over again to land them. It just feels like, to me, the other outside of combat features are totally dead with the way people actually play insight, investigation, and perception checks. In, in my world, perception and investigation are skills that are often used outside of combat and very, very rarely come up in combat. There's very few times in any campaign that I've run or played in where in the middle of combat, you need to look for something or decipher a clue, which means that being able to use these skills as a bonus action is actually irrelevant because outside of the action economy of combat, you can just use perception and investigation as you see fit. I think the real stars of this subclass are insightful fighting, unerring eye, and eye for weakness, which are really cool and for me make this a C subclass because it does offer something but at the same time, steady eye, eye for detail, and ear for deceit don't really offer anything that I find useful at the table. Now, there might be great campaigns that are being run out there that are very much hard-boiled detective investigation-driven campaigns. And I, too, love those concepts. I just I don't run D&D &D in a way that makes this subclass useful there's a very strict and draconian way of running these skills where um you end up with a style of gameplay where players say i would like to perception the room or i would like to in in like investigate the room 
And then you roll a skill check and they either find it or they don't. I prefer a style of play where players like describe how they're looking for things and how they're looking for clues. And in general, if they describe it in a way that engages with the environment, I don't even have the check rolled. I'm just like, yes, you found it. So I prefer a little bit more of a um, engaged and interactive style of of play when it comes to investigation that is very much again i I think i mentioned this offhandedly it's very much inspired by robin laws's gumshoe system so i kind of grab the gumshoe system of like the player's action and intent and what they say and how they say what they're going to do matters more than what they roll on the dice what's really hard for me is like i i'm obsessed with old school film noir uh gritty detective stories i love like harry dresden sherlock holmes i i love these depictions so when i heard about the inquisitive rogue coming out initially i i was so excited because i wanted to play my sherlock holmes fantasy in a dungeons and dragons campaign but it, it's tough. It's tough for me to say that it just doesn't deliver on that fantasy in a way that makes sense in the way that we run the game. Now, again, I, I, I think we're going to give this a C. Could somebody play this and have a great time as the investigator? Yes, but not at the not the way that we run the game and not the way that i've seen mm. most other dms that i've had the joy of playing with not in the way they run the game either so there is a version of the game that the rules here imply exists that the inquisitive rogue would be good at and maybe if you are excited to play the inquisitive rogue and you find a table where these abilities are going to be useful it might be great but I'm I'm having a real hard time seeing it, and I think it's it's a yeah. I, I I just don't. I, it just comes back to that whole idea of like if you've got a player that really enjoys the investigative style of gameplay, it's not about putting the right subclass in front of them. It's about preparing as a dungeon master to run an investigative mystery style game, and that's much more on the dungeon master and how they present the world and how they run the scenario than any of the players' abilities. Next up, we come to the mastermind, who is the greatest schemer of all the rogues. They are the whispers happening behind the throne, the conspiracy theories, the Illuminati. They are the ones plotting out masterful schemes to thwart even the smartest enemies. When you take the subclass right away at third level, you gain the Master of Intrigue feature, which gives you proficiency in disguise kits, forgery kits, one gaming set, and two languages of your choice. You can also spend one minute listening to a speaker of a language and learn how to unerringly mimic those vocal patterns so that you can blend in with native speakers of that language. Also at this level, you're going to gain Master of Tactics, which turns the help action into a bonus action. And additionally, if you're using it to help an ally attack, you can do that at a range of 30 feet instead of 5 feet, as long as the target can see and hear you. At ninth level, you're going to gain Insightful Manipulator. If you spend a minute observing or interacting with a creature outside of combat, you can learn some information about its capabilities compared to your own. The DM gets to tell you if the creature is your equal, superior, or inferior in regards to two of the following characteristics. You can ask about its intelligence score, wisdom, or charisma score, or class levels, if any. At 13th level, you gain the Misdirection class feature, and you might have to read this one over a couple of times to understand how this works, and I'm willing to bet a lot of people didn't even realize this was even a thing. If you are targeted by an attack, well, a creature within five feet of you is granting you cover from that attack, you can use your reaction to cause the creature giving you cover to be hit by the attack instead. This rule is something that people forget about a lot. I forget about it all the time. But your allies grant cover, which is a plus two bonus to AC against range attacks. So if you're standing behind one of your allies and an enemy is shooting you, you have plus two to your AC. 
At 17th level, you gain Soul of Deceit, which means the creatures can no longer read your thoughts through telepathy or any other means unless you allow it. You can also present false thoughts by succeeding on a Charisma Deception check contested by the Mind Reader's Wisdom Insight check. On top of this, no matter what you say, magic that would determine if you're telling the truth or lying cannot do so. You always appear to be telling the truth. The Mastermind is a really interesting subclass to me because I think there's a couple of features here that truly stand out and are really awesome. There's a few that for me that are kind of in the mid range. And then there's a couple that I actually don't like at all. And so you kind of get this mixed ba bag of, of abilities where something like the Master of Tactics, I think is one of the greatest rogue features. The ability to throw out help actions at a range of 30 feet as a bonus action means that your rogue can give the party advantage on their attacks every turn if they want as a bonus action. But then we get something like Insightful Manipulator, and I might be a little biased on this, but I think abilities like Insightful Manipulator are some of my least favorite abilities in Dungeons & Dragons. For me, they seem like information that I don't necessarily care about and knowing it doesn't really benefit me in many ways. The other abilities here are kind of mid-range for me. And so as I'm looking over this, there's some great options, but overall, I think this is a B subclass. I don't think that it's great enough to be outstanding in a lot of campaigns, but I do think that with the use of some of their abilities in certain campaigns that they could stand out as really great rogues. I think there is one thing that you could use finding out someone ability scores for, but it's really difficult with the way this power works. And it would be if you know if someone's intelligence, wisdom, or charisma score is higher or lower than yours, it might help your other party members figure out what spells to target for saving throws against that enemy. Maybe your wizard's trying to figure out whether they should use banishment, hold monster, or mental prison against an enemy, and maybe you can figure that out. But because it's dependent on your own ability scores, if your intelligence is 10, your wisdom is 12, and your charisma is 15, and your enemy has, you know, they could have higher than all of those, but it's not going to help you figure out which one is the lowest. It's also tough because it has to be used outside of combat. Yeah. So you have to talk to your enemy to determine this beforehand for at least a minute without engaging in combat. So yeah. that makes it even a little more difficult to use. Overall, I think the ability to take the help action as a bonus action and to give out advantage in combat to your allies is the coolest feature of the mastermind. And probably the one that you can actually build a play style around. Again, none of these features are bad. And you could certainly play a cool political intrigue campaign where these abilities are super relevant, especially the basically always on glibness that lets you evade magical detection, which is actually a very unique but high level class feature. I wish it wasn't a 17th level feature because then it might actually might see use in some campaigns. But again, the help action is just advantage on one attack roll. You help one person on their next attack against that foe. So there are limits to the help action as to how useful it can be. You're going to feel very impotent if there is a bard or a druid who brought fairy fire. Actually, you saying that made it paint this vivid picture of the rogue who's standing on the battlefield analyzing everything. Throwing out help actions, be like, you need to attack that guy now. This person needs to be hit by this spell. They actually have a few things going on. And I think played properly and in the mm -hmm. right setting. Uh, I, I think that there is something here that is kind of unique and interesting for the rogue. I think the Mastermind Rogue brings something interesting. I think it's a little undercooked overall. So for me, it's a B minus. I, I think you can absolutely make the help action thing in combat work. I think you can use some of the other features. The extra proficiencies are all cool, all wel welcome. This just doesn't have a lot of oomph to it. And, and I think that if you're interested in playing that arch schemer sort of character, I don't know if the rogue is the right vehicle for it. When I put it into an entire package together, 
I, I do think that it's a worthwhile play style for people who are interested in it. Is it the best rogue out there mechanically and in all aspects of the game? No, but for a person who likes the rogue and really likes this concept of the mastermind, it's not going to fail on the delivery of that concept. It, it has enough going for it that I think it's fun. Well, many rogues are associated with urban environments and thieves guilds, some rogues are more at home in the wilds, and there's lots of opportunities for roguish skills to be valuable even in the wilderness. Enter the scout, who in many respects it feels like a very way of like, hey, do you want to mix some ranger in your rogue? Here's a subclass for you. And I think this subclass actually delivers on it pretty well. Let's take a look at what it gets. So starting at third level, you gain Skirmisher, and that makes you hard to pin down. You can move half your speed as a reaction when an enemy ends its turn within five feet of you, and this movement does not provoke an opportunity attack. You also get proficiency in the survival and the nature skills, and effectively expertise in them as well. So your proficiency bonus is doubled for, for checks that you make with these skills. At ninth level, you're gaining superior mobility, which increases your walking speed by 10 feet. And if you have a climbing or swimming speed, it also increases by 10 feet. At 13th level, you become an ambush master. You gain advantage on initiative checks. And the first creature you hit with an attack during your first round of combat becomes easier for all your allies to hit. And they get advantage on attack rolls against that target. At 17th level, you gain sudden strike. Now, if you take the attack action on your turn, you can make an additional action as a bonus action. And you can apply sneak attack to both of those attacks. This is a great 17th level ability for a rogue. Uh, uh, this is an awesome subclass. Yeah. I really like this. I think it's... Uh, first of all, I think the scout is a wonderful pairing to multi-class with a Gloomstalker Ranger and take a bow or a crossbow. Like, five levels of Gloomstalker Ranger, five levels of scout rogue. Ugh, it's like, oh, I love the fact that you get a bonus to your speed and then you can move half your speed as a reaction it's perfect for playing with a ranged character that is going to be using a crossbow or a bow so when an enemy ends their turn within five feet of you you get to move away so if they were there at the start of their turn and didn't move you get to move away which is great it helps you reposition and if they moved up to you they can still smack you in the face but then you're going to get to be able to retreat back just make sure that you know you don't accidentally uncanny dodge instead of doing this because it uses your reaction. Uh, I think this is totally worthy of an A. The mm -hmm. Ambush Master and Sudden Strike abilities at late level are actually two of the better rogue late level abilities. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I actually think that like aside from the, oh, you have proficiency in nature and survival skill, which let's be real, almost every subclass in the game has a throwaway third level, something like this. It's like you gain a cool third level ability and usually an okay third level ability. I mean, nature and survival are pretty good skills and they come up often enough in campaigns that I, I think that they're still useful. I, I just think that this is one of the better rogue subclasses. It's really well designed and there isn't a single ability presented here that makes me go, eh, they're, they're either pretty good or better. Mm -hmm. And, and it's great. I think it's a great subclass. It's definitely a tier. Uh, I, I say that it's an a plus in my books. I, I, I agree. I think the, the, irony of it is is like you look at the formula it's brutally simple the non-combat feature is simply extra skills plus expertise in those skills if more rogue subclasses just followed the model of giving you two extra skill like expertise and two extra specific skills like that would be huge like if we went back to say the assassin and said yeah assassin you get expertise in intimidation and stealth and inquisitive we're just going to give you expertise in investigation and insight and get rid of all those other fluffy features and just let expertise be a strong feature on its own i think those subclasses would be much stronger in their non-combat ability the scout wins through pure simplicity the scout actually has no additional way to sneak attack which is something that a lot of the other subclasses give I think the scout actually might be 
a really good candidate to use that new aim feature in Tasha's. Yeah. Because you can use your reaction to move. So you can scoot away and aim. You can reaction, move away, and then on your turn, not move and steady aim yeah. to make yeah. sure that you have that sneak attack. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. Tasha's, thank you. Fans of the Princess Bride, your subclass is here. The, su the swashbuckler embodies the classic duelist rogue, one with a quick one-liner and a quip for every single situation, a rapier in hand ready to engage in a duel with a very, very witty rapport with their enemy. Starting at third level, you're going to gain fancy footwork. You learn how to land a strike and then slip away without reprisal. Uh, so during your turn, if you make a melee attack against a creature, that creature cannot make opportunity attacks against you for the rest of your turn. You get a free disengage as long as you attack the target. Also at third level, you gain Rakesh Audacity. This ability allows you to add your Charisma modifier to your initiative rolls, but it also gives you an extra way to land your sneak attack. The way this works is this. You don't need an advantage on your attack roll to sneak attack a target if it's within five feet of you and no other creatures are within five feet of you and you don't have disadvantage on your attack roll. At ninth level, you gain the panache ability, which is basically the ability to call somebody out for a duel. You can make a persuasion check contested by the creature's insight check, and the creature must be able to hear you, and the two of you must share a language, so it needs to be able to understand that you're calling it out. If you succeed and the creature is hostile to you, it now has disadvantage on attack rolls against any target other than you. This effect lasts for one minute, and if the creature is not hostile to you, it is now charmed by you for one minute. Note that because you've charmed the target, that means that you have advantage on your charisma checks against them, which is a pretty huge way to just, you make one check off the bat, one persuasion check, boom, you have advantage. At 13th level, you can use a bonus action to gain advantage on any athletics or acrobatics check you make during that same turn. And at 17th level, you gain Master Duelist. If you miss with an attack, you can actually choose to make the attack again with advantage. You can do this once before you need to take a short or long rest. So, Kelly, you are currently playing a swashbuckler in our Shadows of Drakenheim campaign. And I have to say, as a, as a Dungeon Master... I have been surprised at how often all these abilities have been relevant in combat encounters. We're, we're only at level uh, seven right now. So only Rakish Audacity and Fancy Footwork have come online. Um, but both of these abilities have been incredibly relevant on a very regular basis. It really brought back that, that Princess Bride feeling and allows you to be that charming duelist rogue like Zoro or the characters from the Princess Bride. Uh, I think that there's actually multiple characters that you could base oh, this oh, off oh, of the Princess yeah. Bride. Oh, yeah. Inigo Montoya and the Man in Black are both swashbuckler rogues. <laughs> Definitely. And like <laughs> fantasy aside, the abilities not only deliver on that fantasy, but they deliver well on it. Yeah. I think that fancy footwork, again, I use this all the time. Rakish Audacity comes up all the time. And actually the great thing about Rakish Audacity is, yeah, it gets a little complicated because if there's another creature within five feet of you other than the one you're targeting, then you don't get sneak attack. If that creature is an ally who is also within five feet of your target, you still gain sneak attack. So really the only time that this doesn't give you sneak attack, the only time that you can't get it is if you're outnumbered within five feet of you by yeah, enemy it, creatures. When you're surrounded by two enemy creatures on either side of you, or there's two enemies side by side and you can't move without provoking the attack, but then you can kind of get around that in a lot of different ways. The swashbuckler rogue is actually a great social rogue. Yeah. And there's not that many rogue options that say, hey, maybe you should take charisma as well. But this one says, take charisma and be awesome at it you know, make one persuasion check and then now you got a friendly acquaintance, you make friends really easily. Yeah, come on, you can trust me. But what does make the things like the Rakish Audacity feature and the Inquisitive's feature quite valuable, as well as the Arcane Trickster's ability to have a familiar innately that can help them 
uh, or just be a positioner to to key off on is that sometimes your allies aren't going to work with you. <laughs> I don't think that the swashbuckler is as good as an arcane trickster. This this is the problem. So if we just look at all the other rogue subclasses aside from the arcane trickster, I think the swashbuckler is an S. I think it is the S tier uh, rogue subclass. Now we introduce the arcane trickster, but agreeing that the arcane trickster is the best does that force swashbuckler down or is swashbuckler still ahead above the other options the swashbuckler is better than the scout but it's not as good as the arcane trickster the arcane trickster creates abilities for the rogue to do things that they just can't do (laughs) here's the thing though and i think you and i both have a bias um if i were to ask you what your favorite classes to play are it's almost inherently spell casting classes this is this is true this is true and same with me we are both spell casters at heart it's what we steer ourselves towards so obviously the arcane trickster allows you and i to play into the nuances that we understand with mm. the magic and casting system of dungeons and dragons that aside if we look at the rogue as a rogue saying, well, obviously, if you give any class spell casting, you and I are going to argue that that's incredible. The Swashbuckler, for its roguishness, is the best of the best. One thing that came to mind was, if you took Magic Initiate as a Swashbuckler and picked up Booming Blade and Find Familiar with Magic Initiate, that would be crazy good. It would be insanely good to do that. And you would possibly be be eating the Arcane Trickster's lunch if you did that. I mean, you're the one playing it, and you're the one playing it in my campaign. It's it's a hard call. Yeah, I've been thoroughly impressed with the with with the Swashbuckler. If it wasn't for the fact that I'm not the best rogue player, I'm thoroughly (laughs) impressed as well. There was questions about whether I should multi class. And the answer is no, because I'm excited about the other abilities I'm going to gain. Mm-hmm. I'm just continually excited by the Swashbuckler Rogue. Now, again, I, I am playing it at the table. So there is a bias here because I'm in love with my mm-hmm. character. I'm in love with the subclass, but it's delivering. It's delivering everything I wanted it to deliver. I, I don't think that any other Rogue subclass is doing its thing so often as the Swashbuckler is doing its thing and doing it well. I say we give it an S. All right. All right. I, I will go go along with that. I'm still iffy on it. it I think it's we're definitely both. an A plus. Yeah. Yeah. But we'll we'll let the bias guide us. <laughs> I think in this instance, uh, we need to agree that the Arcane Trickster is the better, the best subclass, but if you don't feel like adding spell casting to your rogue, this is by far the best subclass. Yeah, and, and and someone brought up the point in one of our comments that if you don't pick good spells with your arcane trickster, they're not. And the swashbuckler is pretty idiot proof. Like as you said, you're not the best player at playing a rogue, but you get it. And, and this is actually an argument we've had before with other subclasses is that sometimes mm-hmm. variety actually means that there's a chance for a mistake. Whereas yep. with the swashbuckler, there's no chance for a mistake here. No, no. In fact, the, the swashbuckler helps cure the mistakes that players will make in landing their sneak attack. Because if you're 1v1ing somebody, you can sneak attack them. That's idiot proof. If you look on the screen right now, you're going to see our rankings for the rogue subclasses presented both in the Player's Handbook and Xanathar's Guide to Everything. But let's take a look at what our community thought. So we asked our community to vote and tell us what they thought were the strongest uh, subclasses and rank them for themselves. And looking at the Inquisitive, here's what we got. 19.9% of respondents gave the Inquisitive an A. Wow. 43.9 43.9 gave it a B, and 25.3 gave it a C, with slivers of about 5% giving it a D and an S, respectively. So overall, this is a B ranking from the community weighted towards the C side. So it's a B minus from the community overall. 
When we look at the mastermind, we have a 21.2% for A, a 43.2% for B, a 24.2% for C, and 7% for D, and only a very little bit for the S tier. Again, landing in the B category, but slightly more middling than the inquisitive. It's more a straight middle B rather than leaning towards the B minus. So that sounds about right to me. 8.8% of our respondents gave the Scout an S tier ranking, while 39.3% gave it an A, and 36.1% gave it a B, with 134 giving it a C and just a sliver giving it a D ranking. Quite solidly, this puts it in the A ranking, but definitely a lower A ranking with a very heavy lukewarm response on it. People are positive, enthusiastic about the Scout Rogue overall. It adds great features. Some people again said that the Scout Rogue is everything the Ranger wants to be. I'm not sure I agree with that, but certainly the Scout is a great alternative playstyle to the Ranger presented. And I think uh, speaks to the positive response in the community as offering a bit of an alternative option for people who like the Ranger sort of game style, but want that on the Rogue baseline. As we move into the swashbuckler, we see here pretty much exactly what I was expecting. 38.9% gave it the S tier. That is the highest amount of S tiers of any rogue subclass that we saw from the community. 40.4% give it the A tier, 156 with B, and very, very little for C and D, clearly stating that the swashbuckler is in fact one of the strongest subclasses, landing very safely at a split between A and S tier. And Monty and I also were kind of split between whether it was A or S tier. So I think we're in agreement here that it is, it lands in an A from the community, but only by a few percentages. Mm -hmm. So... Many community respondents echoed one of the points that we touched on earlier as well, where the swashbuckler, you can't get it wrong. The arcane trickster, you can. You, if you don't take the best spells with your arcane trickster, uh, see our arcane trickster guide for what those are, um, you can wind up with a character that isn't as good as the swashbuckler. So while the arcane trickster does have a slightly higher potential, uh, I do think that the uh, swashbuckler uh, really is a solid an excellent subclass. So up on the screen right now, you're going to see again our final rankings. And next to that, you are going to see all of the community rankings. And generally speaking, I think the Rogue is a great class with a lot of potential within its subclasses. Some are stronger and some are weaker, but we actually gave nothing the D tier rank here because I think at the end of the day, the Rogue is just a really fun character to play. And depending on the way you want to go with it, there's a subclass out there that will speak mm. to you. So many of the best rogue features are not in the subclasses, but just in the rogue core class itself. Expertise, uncanny dodge, cunning actions, sneak attack, all of these things are amazing features. So a subclass is only just a small part of what the overall goodness that is the rogue is giving you, which means that it is very possible to play an excellent rogue with any of these subclasses. It's just that the scout, the swashbuckler, and the arcane trickster stand head and shoulders over the others, I think, because they offer features that are going to come up really often and be really impactful when they do come up. Whereas the other rogue subclass features are either going to be amazing when they do come up, but they're not going to come up that often, which is what's holding those ones back. So this has been a look at our subclass tier ranking for rogue subclasses part two in Dungeons and Dragons fifth edition. Tell us about your favorite rogue subclasses in the comments below. The videos that we create on our channel are made possible thanks to the incredible generosity of our Patreon supporters. We have a fantastic community on Discord exclusive for our Patreon supporters that you can join by following the links in the description below. You might be interested to hear that we have a Kickstarter launching later this year, turning our Dungeons of Drakenheim live play campaign into a fifth edition module. We're partnering with Ghostfire Games to bring this book to life, and you can follow the links below to join the mailing list so you can be up to date 
date on all the news regarding this Kickstarter. And don't forget to check out our live play, Untold Tales of Drakenheim, which is airing on Tuesday nights at 6 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash dungeon underscore dudes. You can find all of the previous episodes from our campaigns right up over here. And we've been ranking all the subclasses in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition for every other class. You can find all the videos in that series right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time in the dungeon.